Hi, I'm Mauro Porcini, PepsiCo's Chief Design Officer. Join me for our new series where we dive into the minds of the greatest innovators of our time, with the goal of finding what drives them in their professional journey and in their personal life. Trying to uncover the universal truths that unite anyone attempting to have a meaningful impact in the world. This is In Your Shoes. Architects are to become designers of ecosystems, not just designers of beautiful facades or beautiful sculptures, but systems of economy and ecology, where we channel the flow not only of people, but also the flow of resources through our cities and buildings. I'm quoting the guest of today. He's a Danish architect, founder and creative partner of the architecture firm Big, often noted as one of the most influential architects of our time. His most notable projects include the 8th House housing complex, Via 57 West in Manhattan, the Google North Bay Shore headquarters, the Super Keelan Park, and the Amager Resource Center Waste to Energy Plant that incorporates both a ski slope and a climbing wall on the building exterior. In 2016, he was named a Time Magazine 100 Most Influential People. He and his company are the subject of the 2017 documentary, Big Time. His firm has received numerous awards uh, for their work over the years. He is one of the most renowned architects in the planet. Bjarke Ingels, welcome to In Your Shoes. Thank you. A pleasure. <laughs> it's such, such a pleasure to have you with us today, Bjarke. Uh, your your career is just mind-blowing. You became one of the most renowned, famous international architects in the world at a very early age. And I was reading a little bit about your, your past, and I, I found out that actually you wanted to be a cartoonist, and you did architecture school to improve your drawing skills. Is, is it true? What, what is the story? I mean, uh, it, it is true, uh, because... Um, uh, I, I finished from um, from high school uh, at the age of 18, and um, s since I was, you know, in kindergarten, I had always been like the best kid uh, in class at drawing. So I spent um, my my sort of early years drawing uh, drawings for everybody. And when there was a a school comedy uh, or a ski trip where people were making a sweatshirt or a study trip or something where they were making sweatshirts. Uh, or a poster for something, I was always the one drawing it. So it was somehow uh, deep in my self-perception uh, that I was, of course, going to be a cartoonist. But, um, but you know, where, um, you know, especially Belgium and France and, and Italy uh, and America obviously have an incredible uh, scene for, for graphic novels and... Uh, and comic books and uh, and animated cartoons uh, in Denmark, uh, not so much. So so when when I was done with high school, I somehow had to choose uh, what to do, and um, and there was not a lot of uh, there was not a lot of options. Uh, so the one thing that I could find in Copenhagen, and I, my world view was apparently limited to uh, to Denmark, uh, was. Um, the fact that back then the architecture school was part of the Royal Danish Art Academy, it still is. So you have you basically have uh, uh, like painting, sculpture, and architecture within the same art school. And uh, because it was before computers had uh, taken over our lives and everything else, um, the first two years uh, was actually uh, dedicated specifically to giving the, the coming architects all the drawing skills they needed to be able to uh, manifest their visions of the future. Uh, so, um, and because architecture, like uh, um, university is for free in Denmark, it felt reasonable to uh, risk wasting two years of, uh, of, of studies, uh, getting better at drawing essentially backgrounds. Because you can say, uh, as, as a cartoonist, you, you're, you're interested in the action, the life, uh, the interaction between the people, the animals, the vehicles, whatever, uh, the planes flying around. Uh, and the background is more like the setting. Yeah. Uh, but of course, in architecture school, they would, they would teach you to draw 
you know, landscapes and three-dimensional projections of, of buildings. So I thought it can't hurt to uh, get a little bit better at drawing the background. And then, of course, uh, after two years, I was obsessed with the background, and I never went uh, back to, uh, to, uh, to graphic novels. And, and that would happen. I, I think many people, I, especially the young one listening to us today, are thinking, okay, how can I get a career similar to the one of Bjarke? Not just arriving to where you arrive, but arriving so fast. What happened in your life? What did you do right? What did you do differently from others that accelerate your, your journey so much? I mean, I think what, what definitely happened, because like in the beginning, um, also because... The, the art academy it was an art school, it was very free. Uh, maybe a little bit too free for my uh, taste at the time uh, because uh, I didn't know anything about architecture. And um, it was mostly this kind of um, uh, master apprentice kind of setup where you went to a department and in that department you had to submit some, uh, some projects. So, uh, and I normally sort of would say that the only thing you got in the sort of uh, on the first day of school was they gave you um, a key card so you could enter the building, a library card so you could take out books, and a copy card so you could uh, Xerox copy your drawings, right? And then it was like, see you in, in five years, right? Um, that was a little bit, it's not entirely untrue, I have to say. Um, so what happened was that uh, me and another friend, we basically went down to the, uh, to the library and because we didn't really know, I mean, of course, there were some lectures about Le Corbusier and, uh, and Mies van der Rohe and like a few others, but um, uh, we just basically started pulling books out of the uh, of the bookshelf. Uh, and 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 you know, in the beginning, when you have no understanding whatsoever, you just turn the pages, and when you see something that seems relevant, you start reading into it, and then if something seems very inspiring, then you then you then you sort of uh, read all the interviews, all the essays, and when you read the interviews, you start reading the, um, the footnotes. Uh, sort of when they refer to some, something or someone, you find out where it's from by reading the footnotes, and then you go find uh, that particular book by that particular author or that particular architect, and then you start reverse engineering your, um, your curriculum, basically. Um, and then I think, one thing that, that made a lot of sense is that um, you could almost describe my, my, my education, which was in a very, a well, a, a very self-established curriculum, as a kind of serial monogamy in the sense that I would fall madly in love with the work of an architect. And then I would find everything that I could find about that architect. <clears throat> and then I would read everything that that architect had written uh, him or herself, and then I would find the people writing about them, who, who else do they reference? Uh, and then eventually what happens very often, it's a bit like Nietzsche, he calls it to philosophize with the hammer, right? That you, you hammer on the surface of certain concepts uh, to see if there's anything underneath or if it's just a hollow shell. And eventually when you pursue almost any architect, you will reach the fundamental assumptions, the underlying assumptions that if you start questioning those, everything falls apart. Uh, and at that point, you, you would often have found someone else uh, that was either the origin of this architect or uh, a parallel track of this architect, and then that would be your new kind of uh, passion. And then you would repeat this, uh, this, uh, this kind of love affair again until you reach this kind of moment where you start questioning some of the fundamentals, some of the axioms of this particular practice. And, and again, you would have to fall in love again. So, and, and I, I somehow repeated that until I discovered um, uh, Ren Kohlhaas, uh, who in my mind was fundamentally different uh, in the sense that where many other architects see architecture as a kind of autonomous art form, uh, almost autonomous from the rest of society. Uh, and in the work of, uh, of Rampoulas and Romain, the architecture was always in direct dialogue with the society 
that was full of political, economical, geopolitical, social, um, cultural issues. Uh, and they were writing about engineering and program and technology uh, and all kinds of conflicts. Uh, so there was this almost like journalistic attitude towards architecture. Uh, and also I found that rather than being governed by, although they, they definitely have distinct vocabularies, uh, I found them um, less, whereas it was like an architect like Richard Meyer is very well defined. A building has to be white and there's like a certain set of rules and you can't really do anything if it doesn't comply with those rules. So in that sense, a style becomes almost the sum of all your inhibitions. So it's all the things you can't do that ends up defining your style. Whereas in this case, there was something more open about it. And I, I somehow decided to take it to the next level and, uh, and, and try to go and get an internship there to, uh, to see how it was uh, on the inside. It's, uh, it's very interesting because you talk about one of your first work experiences, not just as a work experience, but as a way to learn more. You know, it's uh, many people, they just want to get a job and they're finished with their study and now, and now I'm ready, I get a job. And the way you presented your experience with Rem Kulas was really about, okay, I want to learn more and I want to keep, I, I guess, you, you want to keep learning all your life. You're, you want to be a student for life. I, I, I find that as a, one of the common denominator of all the innovators. They never stop learning, right? No, yeah, yeah. no for sure. It's like, um, uh, it's, it's essentially also like you can, you can read and study as much as you can. And of course, you can, you can go uh, on study trips, which, uh, uh, which I definitely also did. I, I tried to get as close to uh, any, any uh, Ancora's building as I could. Uh, I think any architect has jumped a lot of construction site fences and also slightly broken into a handful of properties to, to, to get to, uh, to where you're maybe not supposed to be. I found out lately that uh, when you arrive with uh, uh, a child, uh, you are even less suspicious <laughs> when you have a, a year and a half old baby, uh, then you're clearly not a burglar. Uh, so that, that, that's a good uh, tip for, for, for any, uh, any curious uh, uh, architect. But, um, but, but of course, uh, uh, going to Ome was definitely a pilgrimage to try to, uh, to see how, how it really happens inside the, the machine room. And then over the years, obviously, you developed your own point of view on architecture, on life, on creativity. Uh, you have been quoted talking about the two extremes that you can find in architecture. On one side, the avant-garde, full of crazy ideas. On the other side, uh, something that is more by the book and and I'm quoting you creating boring boxes eventually with this very corporate kind of approach and and you 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 found that sweet spot that somehow combines the two worlds in something that is new unique and different can can you talk about what is that point of view of yours on architecture yeah like I, I think it's because um you say architecture is um is you know maybe the most powerful tool we have to uh, create the framework for for the life we want to live. So um, it it it's it's not just a, a sort of a self serving art form for the artist to be able to express uh, uh, him or herself, but it's really a way to facilitate uh, life itself. We've uh, We've somehow, as human beings, we've invented uh, an, an additional layer of geography or geology uh, that means that we're, we're not only like we, we're not just left to be able to climb a tree to protect ourselves from uh, from the wild animals or to climb into a cave uh, to get some shelter from the elements. Uh, we can actually design our own trees and our own caves. Uh, and now that they're no longer just trees or caves, we, uh, we have to ask ourselves, what kind of a cave would we like to live in? Uh, and how would, would we like to live? And suddenly, so therefore it has to be very pr practical and functional uh, and perform as, as a habitat. Uh, but then on the other hand, uh, we're not just repeating, you know, this, this was a cave, now we can build our own caves and we keep building them 
like caves. No, no, no. Now that we have new tools, new materials, new technologies, we have to experiment. We have to discover new possibilities that we haven't even thought about. So in a way, you can't just wait for people to demand something. Uh, sometimes you have to offer them something they didn't know that they were longing for. And, and, and then now that you've offered it as a gift almost, uh, you, um, they wouldn't want anything else, right? So, so you have to be both experimental, creative, I think uh, uh, out of the box, create unlikely combinations uh, in order to discover something that might work. But you also have to measure everything against how, how does it perform, what does it do? And it's essentially in those two overlaps that you have the frontier. Because when something is both unexpected and you know creative and innovative, surprising, but it also has a lot of performative um, qualities, it, 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 it almost creates a new typology. Uh, you can say the job of the innovator is to come up with new typologies for the others to copy. Because it's once, it's when you come up with something that is not only because you have a, a specific personality that it becomes beautiful, no, it has something that transcends your touch. It's replicable in a way that means that others can take that new typology and test it and make their own versions of it. Just like, it's like that you can say that uh, when someone writes a beautiful melody, uh, then sometimes the cover song is better than the original because they've created a new, a new format, a new typology that someone else can be inspired by and make an even more beautiful version of it. So the cover song is never the same as the original. It takes it to a, to a new level. Uh, this idea resonates with me so much. I, I'm sure many people listening to us, not just the architects, but the brand designers, the industrial designers, and the in innovators of any kind are, are, are resonating with, with that idea. If I think about our world of PepsiCo, where is 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 mass market, obviously, but we always try to push the envelope to try to, to do something that nobody ever did before. But one of the problems that we have, and this is the question, the problem is not even about us, but it's the fact that you are surrounded then by people that need to approve your designs. Or in our case, you know, there are consumers, we do consumer tests, we see what they think. And often, you said it earlier, you need to propose it first. They need to use it almost, and then they will realize that they actually needed it. And so how do you convince a city or a customer or any, anybody that pay you to do those architecture to, to experiment, as you say, and, and take the risk of experimenting? Yeah, like, I think that's the, that, that is the challenge that maybe especially the architects uh, have. And I think, I think uh, uh, f film directors uh, have a similar challenge. It's because uh, architecture is so expensive uh, and it takes so long to do it. You know, any building takes between five and 10 years to uh, make happen. Uh, and uh, depending on what it is, um, the, the waste to energy power plant that we build in Copenhagen with a ski slope on the roof, even if the architectural part of it is only maybe uh, $50 million, uh, the whole project is more like $500 million. Uh, so, um, that's, uh, that's, that's like the, um, the cost of the movie Avatar, or even more, right? It's like, it's so much money and it took nine years to do it. Uh, and you know, it's, it's gonna, it's gonna be on the skyline of Copenhagen for hopefully forever. But, uh, so, um, and, and the problem is that like you're saying, if you do something proactively, you can make it happen and then people are gonna, they can see how they feel about it once you've done it, right? Uh, where in this case, you have to persuade an army of people to allocate all the resources, to uh, write all the permits, uh, to say, this is what we're gonna do. So before the building can speak for itself, you as the architect have to speak on its behalf. Uh, and of course you have to find this kind of mixture of, uh, of arguments um, that in a very sort of intuitive way allow people to both 
you know, offer them a chance to fall in love with it, like make it compelling, beautiful, sort of exciting, inviting, um, but also make it convincing, uh, rationally, uh, economically, uh, technically. Uh, and I think this kind of combination, uh, it's, you can almost say like almost the most important building materials of the architect is actually uh, all these different um, uh, like narratives you have to uh, uh, have to master in order to make uh, a project really truly come true. Well, and often you have been described as somebody with a larger than life personality. I mean, I know you personally. You have a lot of charisma, and you have your point of view, but you're also fun, and you you know you you know how to interact with people, and how how important it is to be like this to sell those kind of ideas. You know, in front of customers once again that eventually oh, i don't know if to do it or not to do it how important is being your character your personality to drive that success that you gain and then also what would you advise what, what suggestion would you give to anybody out there that, that want to try to leverage that kind of personality to be you know more, more out, outgoing out there uh, in their work in everything they do i would say two things uh, to that i mean i think First of all, I think as, a, as an architect, for sure, I think any designer or form giver, maybe the most important sensibility or ability is uh, yeah. empathy. Uh, and I think empathy is an interesting, because empathy is a form of creativity, uh, because I, I don't necessarily think that, that, that empathy is like, it's not like you feel uh, what the other one is feeling. It's, I don't think you're necessarily plugging directly into the nervous system of someone else, but you, you try to put, put yourself in their shoes and you try to, there's this saying, uh, never judge a man or a woman until you've walked a mile in their shoes, right? Uh, that you somehow try to put yourself in their shoes and you try to imagine what would be important to them uh, what would make them happy? What would make them sad? What would make their lives easier? What would make their lives more fun? What would keep their lives more effective? And by, by trying to empathize, and you try to, because often there's a lot of different interests involved in a project, by trying to empathize, not just with the people that are going to be using, like living in your building or working in your building, but also the neighbors, the people passing by on the street, uh, the people you know, they, they might be living where it's going to cast a shadow or where it's not going to cast a shadow, where it's going to allow the light to come by, where it creates shelter, where it creates uh, <clears throat> shade. And, and by, by putting yourself into these many different uh, sets of shoes, you, um, you end up um, creating a richer requirement for this building. So in the beginning, if, if, the, if the ask or if the challenge is too easy, it's very hard to make it interesting. But ironically, by making the problem more difficult to solve, the standard solution eventually is no longer going to cut it. Because the standard, the standard building wouldn't be able to answer all of these different requirements. And you force the architecture to um, go out of the ordinary because it has to address both this issue and this issue and this issue and this issue and suddenly the standard issue the standard building the standard design won't work and you and you have now made it necessary to find an unusual design as an answer to this uh, to this question so that's maybe the one thing uh, the idea of empathy and then i think the other idea is, is the idea of communication uh, and you can say architects uh, never never work alone, and they also they're never the ones building the building. Uh, uh, they're they're just designing it. And you can say to make uh, an architectural model uh, and an architectural drawing or a sketch or a sketch model or a three D model is a communication tool. It's a communication tool, uh, of course, in the end, so you can show uh, the contractor 
the masons, the carpenters, uh, uh, the metal workers, you know, this is what we're going to do. Uh, now let's do it, right? Uh, but, but before that, it's a tool within the team, the team of architects and designers, the team of uh, engineers uh, of different trades, the different kinds of consultants, and the clients and the, uh, and the sort of city people that have to uh, write the permits to communicate with them what are we trying to do? Uh, and in that sense, I, I think since I, I came from from drawing that I was a cartoonist, um, you can say in the beginning I was, I was drawing by hand and I was using like uh, watercolors, crayons, uh, ink um, with a brush. Um, and you know, I, I've been doing it my entire life. So I was, I had so much feeling in my wrist and uh, that I could, you know, and I could mix the colors and, but then I, we had to draw with a hard uh, with a with a hard line and with rulers, parallel rulers, so you can construct. So I was in the beginning, I was frustrated because I lost a lot of the control, the sensibility I had with my old tools. But then, as I as I as I started mastering it, you know, you could choose the different line weights. You could construct very complex three point perspectives. You can make much more complex drawings without uh, you know getting lost with accuracy that could be measured. Uh, but then, of course, I started uh, drawing with a computer, uh, and now you lost even more of the sensibility because now you were sitting with a mouse uh, and clicking. Um, but suddenly, you could once you had created the, the three-dimensional uh, object, you could apply different materials, different light settings. You could walk through it. So each step, you were losing some of your old control, but you were gaining a whole new repertoire of control. And the final step, of course, has become not just drawing with a crayon or with a hard line or with a computer, but drawing with people. And of course, if you're not the one holding the crayon or clicking the mouse, you, you've lost even more control. But, but of course, you, you have a bigger team. Some people can be experts in certain things. Some people can spend the next two weeks just digging into a deep uh, issues. Uh, another part of the team can spit out different options. So, so each time you lose some of the control you used to have, but you gain uh, a, a new sort of a plethora of, of possibilities. In that sense, I think this idea of communication, if you communicate with a crayon or a hardline or a, a, a computer or, or, or with words uh, and gestures, it's all just ways of getting, uh, getting your ideas uh, you know, from in here and out into, into the open. And, uh, and I would say the more explicit you can do it, like the, the more you can have the, a giant uh, you know, pile of models. So, you, so when you have a meeting, uh, you, know, you can pick up this model or this model, uh, the more you can make the idea available for the creative input of the many. Uh, whereas an idea that is only inside your own head, uh, you're the only one who can see it. So. Uh, so it's really about getting the ideas out there in the open. I, I totally agree with you. And in those two ideas, the idea of empathy that is all about deeply understanding people, needs, wants, dreams. And then communication is once you understand that, you connect with them, you, you communicate with them. There is something implicit to what you say that is this idea of diversity of thinking, right? Because if you need to put yourself in different kinds of shoes, the more diverse is the people you interact with, the more richness you will gain from that interaction because they will help you change in perspective, change point, changing point of view. Today, diversity is a topic very, very relevant that everybody obviously is talking about with the most recent uh, academies here in the United States. Uh, what do you think about the diversity in what we do as creative, as innovators? How important it is? No, but I, I think... Um... First of all, it's uh, um, I mean, it's uh, it's an incredible resource. Um, it's um, it's a bit back to this point about how having a too rigid or too too defined a style, or let's call it a too rigidly defined identity. Uh, makes you, it's like an inhibition. Like, uh, whereas 
if you can uh, open yourself up, and I, in the case of, because architecture is always a collaborative um, art form, the, the more the more you can find ways where every team member can arrive with their uh, with their perspective, and of course, depending on where you grew up, in what city you grew up in. If it was in the countryside, if it was like a, in a big city, if it was, uh, you know, in the in the tropics or in the Arctic, or if it was like, a, uh, you know, in, in, in India, Asia, Africa, uh, North America, you're gonna have all kinds of background experiences, but also all kinds of assumptions actually that, uh, that there's certain things you don't think to question because it's you, you can't see the forest for all the trees, right? You, they say in, in hermeneutics, you can't uh, see your own horizon of, of understanding because it is that horizon of understanding with which you see the world. Uh, that's also why it's, it's a great gift to, uh, to learn more than your mother language because suddenly you realize that, you know, in French or in Spanish, they say it completely differently than they do in Danish and you start understanding that the language you speak as your mother tongue is full of is full of uh, preconceptions or assumptions. That's that's why Schindler says you should speak like a foreigner in your own language. You should try to speak your own language without those assumptions, without those uh, preconceptions. Uh, and I think there's nothing better uh, than uh, than having a, a diverse team uh, or trying to sort of gain input from a diverse group of of potential users or neighbors to um, to identify those assumptions and, and to open them up. And, and I would even say from, um, and, and of course you will end up with, with more interesting, exciting and rich uh, ideas and, and forums and designs, uh, but also they will of course be welcoming uh, in, uh, to, to more, uh, more kinds of, of potential users. And, and also they will be surprising in, in great ways to uh, the same amount of, of potential users because it, once you inherit something that came from another insight, from another culture maybe, or another perspective, but you say, hey, that could work here, then it's gonna be a nice little um, food for thought for someone who then encounters it. Like, like uh, we did this um, uh, urban, uh, urban space in, in Copenhagen uh, called Superkingen uh, where, which is in the most ethnically diverse neighborhood in all of Denmark. 60 different nationalities uh, live around this urban space. It's a kilometer long urban space in the middle of Copenhagen where there used to be train tracks and now it's, it's this urban space. And, and we thought, um, in a way, first of all, as a, as, a, as a way to create ownership, we said it's going to be so hard to create, you know, a kind of homogenous space that's going to feel like home for so many different kinds of people. Uh, so we, we thought, why don't we make it a celebration of, of cultural and ethnic uh, and demographic uh, diversity? So, um, so we reached out to the entire local community via different channels, uh, like Facebook, uh, online. There was a big mailbox in the middle of the space where people could drop in ideas. And then we asked people to suggest elements from their other home country uh, that they thought could be cool to have here in Copenhagen. So in the end, there's 120 different objects. Also, the plants come from different uh, countries, of course, limited to plants that can actually grow in, uh, in Denmark. But we, we found hemp palms in China that grow in a Danish climate. So, uh, so it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty diverse. Um, but, but of course, it ends up becoming this kind of incredible collage. And, and I started realizing that in one way, you can see all of Earth as one big laboratory where 7.8 billion people are constantly, every day, conducting experiments in how to best inhabit the planet. So that means that it's a kind of lab full of innovations and inventions that are just waiting to be discovered and to spread and you know, just as an example, I know that in Melbourne and Sydney, they call their bicycle lanes Copenhagen lanes, oh. 
because they took the sort of design uh, manual from uh, from the Copenhagen ones. They they are, they are shifted uh, in uh, in elevation, so that the cars won't just drive over because there's actually a curb. So you have two curbs, one from the sidewalk and then one down to the actual road, right? Yeah. So um, so this idea that you know, of course, the Japanese they have certain things that are way cooler. It's like all their all the vending machines everywhere with hot and cold beverages. Uh, we should we should have them in, in Copenhagen. We don't yet, but uh, uh, we will do. Like I, I know that Copenhagen was the first place to have the city bike, uh, the free system of bicycles that have now spread elsewhere. Uh, I think all the scooters uh, that most people see as a plague, but I think we have to somehow find a way to live with them. I think they they came from Silicon Valley and have now spread to uh, to the rest of the world. So like so what's what that's what we try to do with the uh, super is to imagine it as a kind of global best practice where we could handpick elements from uh, from different cultures and uh, and bring them to Copenhagen. But you mentioned the word planet and immediately the, another word came to mind is the word of sustainability. As you can imagine, because of the nature of the industry we play in, sustainability is a hot topic. We are investing a lot of money and effort trying to be as sustainable as possible in everything we do. What is sustainability in architecture? And then you're being... You, you talk about hedonistic sustainability. What do you mean with that? Yeah, like I, I think it was like a, actually the first project we did um, almost 20 years ago was the Copenhagen Harbor Bath. Uh, and it was essentially, um, it had been decided to, instead of like normally in a, in a port, uh, all the surface water just f washes over the, uh, the piers and then it drops in the, in the ports. So that means that all the dirt uh, is, is constantly washed into the port, which means that the port ends up being quite polluted. So then Copenhagen made some investments to make sure that all of the surface water went into the sewers instead. And shockingly quickly, like in less than a decade, suddenly the water quality of Copenhagen port had become so clean you could swim in it. So we designed the, the first sort of harbor bath in, in Copenhagen. Uh, and it became this kind of sensation overnight because it completely changed people's perception of what a port is. That, you know, instead of sitting in your car for hours to get to the Hamptons, you can jump in the port in the middle of the city. And it became clear that a clean port is not only nice for the fish, it's amazing for the citizens of that city because they can just, they have a beach in the middle of, uh, of town. It's almost like Sule Pavila Plage, but uh, actually uh, created. Uh, and um, and that kind of made, made, made us sort of discover this idea, hey, what if a sustainable city or a sustainable building is not only better for the environment, it's also better for the lives of the people inhabiting it. Then suddenly, um, sustainability doesn't become this kind of necessary compromise or uh, this kind of moral uh, impetus, but it really becomes the more desirable solution. It's just like, you know, the reason that the electric car is finally coming is because Tesla made the fastest, accelerating, safest, best car ever. And now the it's the most valuable uh, car company uh, uh, on the planet. Uh, not just because it was the right thing to do. No, no, it was the coolest thing. So that the Tesla is not only the an electric car, it doesn't have any kind of greenhouse gas emissions. And if the, if the electrical source is renewable, it, it's, uh, it's carbon neutral, but it's also the greatest and most fun, fastest accelerating, most enjoyable, most driverless car out there. And, and I think that's, that's hedonistic sustainability. And I, of, of course, our most recent example in Copenhagen is the, is the waste to energy power plant that is not only the cleanest waste to energy power plant in the world, but it's so clean that we could turn the roof into an alpine ski slope with hiking paths and ski slopes and the tallest climbing wall in the world. So imagine if all the public infrastructure uh, becomes, you know, clean technology, S suddenly you can have this kind of man-made uh, mountain range of cool parks in a city, not just like big boxes that cast shadows on the neighbors and block the views. So I think that's, that's essentially the idea that if, if you want the environment to win, it shouldn't just be the right thing to do, it should be the best and most desirable 
and the right thing to do. Uh, yeah. And therefore, is a design challenge. It is something you you say it as well, exactly. and not yeah. not an easy one because essentially you not to compromise on cost or materials on on the convenience of some certain materials or certain functionalities is, is not easy, but it, I completely agree with you. We need to give people what they need, what they want, what they dream, what they desire, and we need to try to do it in a sustainable way, actually adding value through sustainability. It's a, it's a powerful concept. What inspires uh, Bjarke Ingels? Where do you find your inspiration? Yeah, but I think um, it was kind of funny, like... Um, my, my experience is actually that almost any subject, uh, if you if you find someone who has extremely deep knowledge about the subject and is very passionate about it, then any subject is potentially uh, fascinating, right? So uh, so that that's why it's interesting to hang out with uh, with people that are passionate about uh, uh, you know what they do or 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 maybe not what what they do, but like a, cer a certain thing that they, they have some kind of a deep passion because uh, they become a, in a way um, uh, an invitation to, to discover a world that is different from the one you, uh, you know about. Um, and, I, and I think maybe that's one of the great things about being an architect is that, the, uh, you know, we never work for other architects because they, they, can, they can make a building themselves, right? So we always work for someone who does something that is not what we do. Uh, and, and to do what we do, we need to n know as much as possible. In a way, we have to educate ourselves uh, as fast as possible to understand what are, the, what are the key criteria of this particular subject. We just started uh, maybe the biggest project we've worked on so far, and, and we, we just finished a museum about watchmaking for the watchmaker Urma Piquet, uh, and um, and and when I and I, when I sort of drove to uh, Le Poissu, uh in uh, Valley du Joux in, in Switzerland, the cradle of watchmaking, uh, five years ago, um, I knew nothing about watchmaking, and I wasn't particularly captured by uh, original watches. Um, I didn't have a watch, uh, and. Uh, and then I meet this master watchmaker from Galicia, who's living in Switzerland, and, and he shows me the, uh, the, the uh, grand complication workshop where he's restoring these uh, ancient ultra complicated uh, timepieces. And, and, and he starts sort of telling the story about, um, you know, uh, uh, he, he wants to restore the, um, the bell inside the watch. And of course, there, there's no real bill and there's no loudspeaker. So like the, the cool thing you start discovering is, oh, yeah, and watchmaking form and content is the same thing. We've become so used to the idea that form and content are two different things. It's like the form is like an arbitrary uh, container and then the content is the software that makes it function. Uh, well, in, uh, in watchmaking, it's the same thing. The, the interlocking of the gears the coiling of the metal to store the tension that gets delivered with the escapement in a format that is usable, the, the, the anchor that swings around and harvests the kinetic energy of your movement. Um, and, and then he starts making this tubular bell. And then almost like in alchemy, he has a sheet of paper with different colors on it, shades of yellows and uh, oranges and pinks and blues. And then he starts heating the metal with a little... Uh, can believe not you know, uh, and then he starts matching it to uh, this uh, color grade, and each color represents the color of the metal at a certain temperature. And when he finally has a, a, a visual match to the, uh, the the color he's going for, he dips it into a bath, and it somehow freezes the molecular structure of the metal in that composition. Uh, and then he starts finding, you know, like so it becomes this kind of a incredible kind of material science, uh, alchemy uh, uh, kind, of, kind of process. Um, and it dawns on me that maybe watchmaking and architecture is one of the few disciplines left that where form and content is intrinsically entwined. Uh, because it's not just about a software onto a hardware, it's really about the fact that the hardware is the software. 
the form is the function. Um, and then sort of slowly, I began to realize, uh, you know, how fascinating uh, watchmaking is. And, and one of the things that, so I've, I've had a watch uh, uh, ever since we, we won the competition. Uh, I, I thought maybe I should practice what I preach. Uh, <laughs> and it's this kind of open work, skeletonized, so you can see all of the inner workings. And sometimes it feels like I have a little life on my wrist, a little mechanical life form. And then it dawned on me that it's not just a metaphor. Because if you look at a, at a living cell, uh, you know, you and I consist of, uh, I believe, billions or trillions of living cells. Each living cell consists of a lot of enzymes uh, that are essentially um, uh, complex proteins um, that, uh, that interact uh, with, uh, with, uh, with materials according to the laws of physics and chemistry. Uh, so each enzyme on its own is not living. It, it just follows the laws of physics and chemistry. But with the complex combination of all of those proteins, they form a living cell. Uh, and you know they harvest energy from the surroundings. They maintain a constant state. Uh, they do a few more things, but when you think about it, uh, a watch is actually a lot of gears, uh, little little geometries that on their own are not uh, living, uh, but the way they're combined and interacting, it has the emergent property that they can harvest energy from their surroundings, in the case from me when I move, and then they can maintain a constant state and, and tell time and, and other things. So in that sense, a watch is in some form a mechanical life, uh, a self-perpetuating, uh, self-sustained uh, little entity. Uh, so in that sense, so, so suddenly something that I had no interest in whatsoever, just because of encountering people that were like really deep uh, in the subject, uh, it starts uh, enriching my world uh, to become bigger. Uh, and of course, some of those some of those analogies can be can be used. Uh, in, in other spheres. So, so I think maybe the one thing that truly inspires me, long answer to a short question, is you know to to visit worlds and then in a way to see to see the pair the the similarities and the differences between these different worlds and then in a way to migrate ideas from one world to another. Uh, almost like with super keen to migrate certain ideas from the rest of Copenhagen and in this case, to migrate certain ideas from watchmaking into, you know, the science of ecosystems or into, uh, you know, uh, 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 other aspects of, uh, of life. Oh, look, your answer is so precious. I really hope that people will listen very careful to, carefully to what you say, because you talk about passion, passion of others that inspire you, but also you, you can feel the passion that you have in that search, in that hunt for new ideas and inspiration. I always talk about the fact that inspiration at the end of the day comes from within, is inside you. God knows how many people went in, in a similar trip, to the you know similar to the one you made, and visit these uh, watchmakers, and they didn't see what you saw. You saw what you saw because of who you are and how you look at the world and your curiosity and your empathy and your passion, everything you have been talking about today. And it was beautiful the way then you told that story, talking about communication, you share, you know, and what I really think is magic, and you said it, is then, then you found connections. You know, uh, Steve Jobs talked about connecting the dots. I think innovators, that's what we do. You know, you, you see something in the world and you transfer it somewhere else. In your story, there was all of this and it's really really inspiring and and to many people walk in the world so blind to what's going on around them around us and the reality is it will be enough to just put the lenses of curiosity to really be inspired by so many things that happen out there one of the things i love the most for instance is nature the mechanic you know of nature is unbelievable and we learn so much in history from nature but again so many people don't stop you know, to look at nature with that kind of curiosity. I have one last question that is a, is a really personal question. 
personal for me. It's not personal for you, but uh, I live in New York, and there is one building that you made, the Via 57, that reshaped the skyline of New York, all these vertical buildings. And here arrive big, we are Kingos, and, and you redesign that skyline, uh, creating something. I, 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 I will describe it in a very bad way if I try. You know, it's between a sales and a pyramid. What was the inspiration of that? Can you tell us a little bit about the building that is so iconic? Yeah, but, it, it, but it's kind of funny because like, um, it was like uh, 10 years ago, uh, I was, uh, now it's 2020, I moved to New York uh, 1st of September 2010, so ex exactly uh, 20 years, uh, 10 years ago, and let's say shortly before that, six, six months before, um, I had actually in 2007, I, I had a, a show at, um, at the storefront Gallery for Art and Architecture uh, uh, in Soho, and um, Joseph Greener was the curator. And he invited us to come and, and exhibit our work in New York for the first time. I had just met uh, this um, uh, American uh, developer, Douglas Durst, uh, who had built the first um, LEED Platinum certified uh, uh, residential skyscraper and commercial skyscraper in, uh, in the world in, in, in New York. So he had been invited by the mayor of Copenhagen to speak about sustainable high rises. Uh, and I was in the audience and, um, and he makes this kind of passionate uh, presentation. Um, but somehow the architecture in my mind looks a little like it would always do. So, so he clearly had an ambition about environmental performance, but it felt like his architects were, were just trying to make a, a good looking building. And then I, afterwards I asked him, you know, how come all the buildings look like buildings? Like, have you ever thought that the architecture could play an active role in the environmental agenda that you have? Because he was talking a lot about all the technical upgrades that were put into the building. Um, and it, it maybe annoyed him enough to, uh, to sort of remember, at least when I invited him to come for the, for the opening, he showed up and, and, and we started a little friendship, but I, I never expected that he would hire us uh, for anything. And, and, and he also confessed he never thought about hiring me as an architect, but, but we enjoyed each other's uh, sort of uh, conversations. And then um, uh, at some point he invites me to say, you know, why don't you take a look at this little building we have in, um, uh, on the west side of Manhattan, uh, a little building site. And it was like almost an entire city block. And, um, and I was just thinking, this is our chance to build something on Manhattan. Um, let's like make something really, really simple. Uh, and also he was, uh, he didn't want to do a tower. And I thought, damn, like we're finally building, uh, you know, uh, on the bedrock that, that's the cradle of the skyscraper. And, and, and we're not supposed to do a skyscraper, that's insane. Uh, and he said, like, something more mid-rise, like the eight house or the mountain that you did in Copenhagen. Okay, so, okay, we said, the one thing that we can mess up is a perimeter block. You know, that's, it's, it's, it's all of Europe consists basically of perimeter blocks, you know. You, you build along the, 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 the sidewalk, and then you put a courtyard in the middle where there's some nature. And we thought, well, maybe that could be radical in a Manhattan context. Um, but then, of course, to make the courtyard work and to get the density that the site allows, if you would just extrude it, of course, it works in five floors or eight floors like in Milan or five floors like in Copenhagen. Uh, but once you make it 20 floors, uh, no light comes into that courtyard. So then, of course, if you want to do the courtyard, it has to be extremely asymmetrical. So we ended up making it the height of a handrail in the southwest corner. But then, of course, it became this kind of absurd spire uh, 40 floors high in the in, in the northeast corner uh, and and it was like the, the thinking that got us there was kind of simple rigorous and clear the final result looks like this kind of crazy uh, gesture uh, but because we had arrived there together um, once we arrived there we were already you know there so I think if we would have come to the first meeting with, with the final design, that, that might as well have been the end of that, uh, <laughs> uh, of that conversation. Uh, but we didn't, and I, you know, we wouldn't even have dared. Uh, but because we arrived there slowly together, um, when we were finally there, it was like, so yeah, of course, this is what we're doing. And the result is a, is a rather striking new silhouette on the Manhattan skyline. But 
the real reason it's there is so that you can have this kind of cent mini central park in the middle of the block that gets uh, the the sunset uh, over the Hudson River all the way into uh, the deepest part of the block. So it's, you know, anyway, a lot of people see the striking gesture and then afterwards they might discover, hey, there's an oasis inside. The funny thing is it's all about the oasis and to make the oasis happen, we had to end up with the striking gesture. So it's almost the other way around than what you might think that the kind of blatant expressive personality is actually the side effect of this kind of very simple idea of putting an oasis in the middle of the city. Well, I'm going to close with this story. I, I, it's beautiful, the story itself about the building, the genesis of the building. But I, it's fascinating also to think that one of the most iconic buildings of Manhattan didn't come out of a competition or of a normal process, but it came out of two individuals that connected culturally. They put themselves out there. You know, this kind of cultural generosity and willingness to connect with others without a specific goal, not to get a job or just for the pleasure of sharing and challenging and thinking together. You know, you and I know each other. We have common friends like Michel Rochkin or Stefan Sagmeister that are very similar in all of this, you know, out there talking, connecting, and maybe, maybe something will come in the future, maybe not, and we're going to be fine anyway. And that's the beauty, I think, of many innovators. They put themselves out there with generosity. They build that kind of communication, all based on empathy and curiosity, passion that you talk about to us today, and then magic things can happen. Thank you so much, Bjarke. It was very, 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 very inspiring. Uh, always a pleasure, man. Always a pleasure. <laughs> Ciao. Thank you. Okay.